I promised to tell you about the many passages in the Hebrew Scriptures where the word olam appears, which is the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek ion. And I'm going to show you how it's impossible for this word to mean eternity or forever. And that's very important because the translation of the Greek word ion and its adjective ionian into forever and into eternal and into forever and ever in the Greek Scriptures has fooled many people, common, careless readers of the Bible, that eternal torment is a biblical teaching, which it is not. I'm going to share those verses with you tomorrow. But today I want to elaborate on a good analogy I gave you yesterday about gravity. That the Christian religion has somehow tricked people in analogy form of buying gravity. The example I gave was, imagine someone coming up to you and saying, Psst, Hey, buddy, how would you like to remain on the planet Earth? How would you like to stick to the ground with a consistent uniform pressure? In other words, I can make it so that you don't fly off into space. I can make it so that you stay rooted to the ground at a uniform rate, also known as gravity. Who would go for something so absurd? Because by the grace of God, gravity is free. By the grace of God, gravity is already provided for every inhabitant of the planet Earth. But if the government could do it, it would charge you for gravity. It would try to control it. It would try to regulate it. It would try to be the arbiter in deciding who gets gravity and who doesn't. But alas, gravity is free. Would anybody be so stupid as to receive a salesman into their home who was selling them gravity. Well, as the saying goes, there's one born every minute. A sucker, that is. So you better believe there are people who would buy someone telling them of the wonders that they can do for them, that is, keeping them on the earth, that is, from flying into space at a uniform and constant pressure. People, yes, there are people who are that stupid. Why does Christianity as a religion, why does the religion of Christianity exist today? Because there are apparently a thousand born every minute. There are millions of people who have allowed themselves to be suckers, who have allowed themselves to be convinced by the Christian religion that they can get you eternal life with God. They've made themselves a government. They've made themselves the arbiters. They've made themselves door-to-door -door salespeople of something that you already have, which is eternal life with God. You have it just as much as you have gravity. As free as gravity is, so is eternal salvation. So is eventual immortality. So is living together with God. How could Christians have convinced so many people to buy something that's free? Because they have misused this book the Holy Scriptures, the Bible. They have taken advantage of the mistranslation of the critical word ion and its adjective aeonian, which means eternity, uh, which means for an age, an eon, age lasting, always to do with time. They've taken advantage of the mistranslation of that word to create the false teaching of eternal torment. They've taken that and used it as leverage 
They've used it to become brokers, self-appointed brokers of eternal life. And in order to get more people into this scam, Christianity is a giant scam. It's a giant hoax built on self-righteousness, on pride, that is furthered by a convenient mistranslation of the Bible. That they don't want to see the truth of it because the truth of it would end the scam. Why is there value in the scam for them? Because they lose power. They will lose power. The Christian religion, like a big government, wants power and control all over you. They like being the arbiters of your eternal destiny. They like holding the keys to eternity, but they don't. It's a scam. It's a lie. And if you believe it, you're giving them power that they don't have, and you're acknowledging a fear that doesn't exist, you're acknowledging a reality that's impossible, namely that anyone could suffer an eternity apart from God, subsequent to a Savior coming to the earth to die for all. They have to convenient, they have to lie about that. They have to hide that. They don't know what to do with that. That Jesus Christ said he came into the world to save sinners. The fact that he came into the world to save those who are lost, that he's the shepherd who seeks the lost sheep, they have, to, they have to hide that fact under the rug because it just doesn't, in their own minds, they can't make it gel with what they think are passages that threaten eternal torment to anyone who doesn't believe. And again, they are more than happy to make the rules of who gets in and who doesn't. It's a power game. And as soon as the game is up, as soon as you tell them that, whoa, everybody's got eternal life. Everyone will live with immor will live immortally with God forever because of the work of Jesus Christ's cross. They don't like that information because it gives the power, it takes the power away from the centralized authority and gives it back to who it belongs. Actually, it belongs to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ won eternal life for everyone. And all you have to do to qualify for it is to be born in Adam. If you're a member of the Adamic race, if you're a human being, then you're in. And I can prove that from the scriptures. The same scriptures that Christians would hide from you. The first verse is Romans 5, starting with verse 18. I'd like to introduce this, though, with Romans 5, 15. Not as the offense, thus also the grace. Paul is here saying that the grace of Christ is much greater, much more powerful than the offense of Adam. He says, for if by the offense of the one, which is Adam, the many died, which is everybody, much rather the grace of God and the gratuity in grace which is of the one man, capital M, Jesus Christ, to the many, the same many who are condemned in Adam, superabounds. Verse 18, consequently, the result of verse 15 is that as it was through one offense for all humanity, for condemnation, thus also it is through one just award for all humanity for life's justifying. One work of Christ's at least brings everyone out of the one work of Adam. What did the one work of Adam do? Condemn the entire race. What does the one work of Christ do? Well, if he's at least the equal of Adam, he has to bring everyone out of the condemnation and sin that Adam brought people into. But he's going to do more because not as the offense, thus also the grace. The grace is much greater than the offense. So if I were to tell you that Christ is going to bring everyone out of the condemnation of Adam, he's going to bring everyone out of the death of Adam, I'd be selling Christ short because the grace is superior to the offense. It's not equal to it. Christians don't even make it equal to it. They make it less than that, much less. Adam condemned everyone. Christ can only rescue a few. A few of those wise people who believed in Jesus somehow managed to overcome an ironclad declaration of God in Romans 3, verses 10 and 11, that there's not one righteous, no, not one. No one is seeking out God, no one. They've all gone, gone out of the way. By some miracle, some people are able to exercise their wills 
and save themselves. This is also a false teaching, but it's one of those false teachings that Christianity likes to use to get you into their power. They pull you in by saying you have to exercise your free will. And when you ask, how do I do that? They, they, they alone have the answers. You need to come to their church. You need to say their sinner's prayer. You need to sign a statement of faith, their statement of faith. All this to get you eternal life. It's a lie. You have eternal life based on your association with Adam. The fate of humanity comes down to two individuals, not two billion and two or 22 million and two. Jesus wins, in case you don't realize. 1 Corinthians 15 is a verification of this truth. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Even as, as in Adam, there we go again with Adam, same as Romans 5, same topic. Even as in Adam, all are dying. Is that everyone? Yes, it is. There's no exception to people who are dying in Adam. Thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. That is, made alive beyond the reach of death. That's a special word. It doesn't mean mere resurrection. People who are raised from the dead can die again. But people who are vivified, different Greek word, live immortally with God. How does this happen? It comes down to, again, Adam and Christ. Even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. In both these cases, Adam and Christ become the channel. Adam is the channel through which all become condemned and dying. Christ is the channel by which the same all are vivified. That is, given life beyond the reach of death. Many people like to misquote this verse. They say, as in Adam all are dying, thus also all in Christ shall be made alive. And they paint this as to mean that only those who believe in Christ shall be made alive. But that's not the inspired order of the words. It's in Christ all, not all in Christ. Christ is a channel that affects the same all Adam affected. You missed the point of the parallel if you say that, yes, everyone came into condemnation involuntarily through Adam. Yet now you have to volunteer your way into Christ. Where are you anywhere in this passage? except as identified with either Adam or Christ. No one's here individually, is my point, either in Romans 5 or here in 1 Corinthians 15. No one is here individually. Everyone is here as a corporate body. The corporate body condemned in Adam and the same corporate body affected by, saved by, pulled out by, justified by Jesus Christ. And the lie of someone telling you that you have to buy this, the lie of someone telling you that there are hoops to jump through to get this, it's a scam for power. It's a scam for control. It's a scam for survival. The institution lives to protect itself and it uses people as pawns and it misuses the scripture. And there's a sucker born every second for this. Okay. Yeah, I want to live forever. And in order to make it more uh, appealing, again, they misuse scripture verses. As I watch my video on Monday, watch my videos from last week. They misuse uh, mistranslations of the word hell. Which in no case, any word translated hell in the Greek scriptures, Hades, Tartarus, and Gehenna, not one of those Greek words answers to the Christian fiction of a place of eternal torment where people who don't believe in Jesus will burn and be tortured for eternity. That is a sick concept. I would have to believe it if it were in the Bible. It's not. It's in no correctly translated Bible. And if you don't have happen to have a correctly translated Bible, then you need to get a concordance that is keyed to your Bible. The NASB has a concordance associated with it. Go to the concordance, find out how they mistranslated the Greek words Gehenna, Hades, and Tartarus. Look how they mistranslated the Greek words Ion and Ionion. Another version, the NIV, common popular English version. Fortunately, that is by the grace of God, I meant to say, this version also has a concordance associated with it. Get the concordance look up on the translators. Check up on the translators. You'll find out that you've been screwed. 
The King James Version has two concordances associated with it, either Young's Analytical Concordance or Strong's Concordance. I have a version that puts the concordant words in the text. That's why it's called the concordant literal New Testament. It saves you the work of looking up each individual word. It's you know, The words are uniformly translated. But for years, before I knew about this, I did the work myself. I went to a concordance. And so the Christian corporation, the power brokers, in order to sell you gravity, in order to, for you to jump through hoops to get something that you already have but simply don't know that you have, that's where I come in, they also invent a dire consequence. It's like the gravity guy saying, hey, psst, you want to you wanna be, you want to remain on the earth? Uh, psst, I got what you need. And then they say, imagine this, if you don't buy what I'm offering you, you will be thrust into the earth. You'll be thrust by a fearful, godlike force to the earth's molten core where you will remain forever. And they scare you into buying this thing. So they're screwing you on both ends. They're screwing you, first of all, that you even need it, that you even have to buy something that you already have. That's stupid enough. That's a crime enough right there. And the ignorant are buying it. The ignorant are saying, yes, I had to join. I had to say the prayer. I had to become a Christian. I had to become a Christian. I had to join this organization in order to be with God for eternity. Well, what would happen if you didn't? They told me that if I didn't, that I would be thrust into a terrible place called hell where I would be burned and tortured forever by a loving God in spite of a Savior having come to save me. That sucks, doesn't it? Huh? It's worse than that. So they screw you on both ends with the fact that you need it and with the punishment that they say you're going to get if you don't buy it. And millions of people out of fear for their own lives fall for it and they join the Christian religion. The mark of a cult is to threaten your eternal destiny if you don't join it. And that's what Christianity does. It has every mark of a cult. Get my book, How to Quit Church Without Quitting God. In that book, I have a whole chapter on cults. And I prove, using Christianity's own qualifications of what marks a cult, their own list of what, how, what to look for in, in, in a cult, I turn it on them. It's the most entertaining chapter in the entire book. I turn their own points of a cult on them to prove that Christianity is the cult. I'm not the cult. I have nothing to join. You don't have to sign on to a statement of faith in order to follow me. I don't threaten your eternal happiness if you don't like me. What I'm doing is I'm just out telling everybody that you already have gravity. You don't need to buy. Don't listen to these people who are trying to sell you something that you already have. I am exposing the lie of Christianity. And while you're at it, you could go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That says... In verse 14, for the love of Christ is constraining us. That is making us say what we're saying. This is Paul speaking, but I'm now saying it to you personally. The love of Christ, the love of God and Christ that was given to me by God in Christ is making me say this. It's constraining us, judging this, that if one died for the sake of all, consequently, all died. One died for the sake of all. Jesus Christ died for the sake of everyone. And if he did that, then everyone is considered to have died. And Romans chapter 6 says that one who dies has been justified from sin. All you, And this answers perfectly with Romans 5, verses 18 and 19, and 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 5 Yet all is of God who conciliates us to himself through Christ and is giving us and he's giving me this message. The dispensation of the conciliation, how God was in Christ conciliating, that is making peace 
to the world through himself, not reckoning their offenses to them. God is not now, not now reckoning the offenses, the sins of the world to it. Because Jesus Christ came and took away the sins of the world. And yet what does Christianity do? They level these sins against you. They take something that was taken away, sin. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. 1 Timothy 1, 15. God is conciliated, that is, at peace with the world through Christ, not reckoning their offenses to them. Verse 19 of 2 Corinthians 5. And yet the first thing Christianity does is they reckon your offenses to you. They tell you that you're a sinner bound for hell. That's the lie. This is saying God is at peace with you now, based on the cross of Christ, with all humanity. He's at peace with you. Christianity says he can be at peace with you with you if the price is right. He can be at peace with you if you do what we tell you to do. That's the lie. God is now conciliated. He's not reckoning your sins to you. Christianity says your sins are going to keep you from God for eternity unless you join us. That's a cult. All the invitations to come to God, to come to Christ, in the Bible. These are invitations to aeonian life, life of the ages. This is not eternal life. It's something more. It's something early. It's something even better. If eternal life is the show, then aeonian life, which the scriptures speak of, listen to my videos last week, they're the backstage pass to the show. I herald two different things. I herald that God is at peace with the world. He's not reckoning sins. If you're an Adam, then you will eventually be justified and given immortality. Being, You'll be vivified with Christ. That's guaranteed. That is guaranteed. Like the gravity that holds you to the earth. Guaranteed. I teach that. And I take away the lie of the Christian religion. I also herald... Jesus Christ. I, well, I herald what I just told you. I herald that message. People who believe the message that gravity is operating on you, that God is at peace with you, that you have this law of Jesus being greater than Adam, people who believe that end up believing God. And then they come in, then they get the backstage pass. Everybody's going to the show. That's a given. Christianity is trying to sell you a ticket to the show that you're already booked for. If you believe what I'm telling you, wonderful. You get to come in early. You get to come in before other people get to come in. Everybody comes in like gravity. But not everybody receives this message I'm telling you. Whether you receive it or not, it applies to you. Whether you receive it or not, that's what I'm saying. But if you do receive it, boom, you get a backstage pass to the show. Send this video everywhere. Expose the liars of Christianity. And I'm not saying they wake up in the morning saying they're going to lie to people. They don't do it on purpose, but the result is the same. Millions are deceived into buying something that they already have. I, I can't stand for this to be happening.